Dead Souls, Part One, Chapter One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dead Souls, by Nikolai Vasilievich Gogol, translated by D. J. Hogarth. Part One, Chapter One. To the door of an inn in the provincial town of N there drew up a smart britchka, a light spring carriage of the sort affected by bachelors, retired lieutenant colonels, staff captains, landowners possessed of about a hundred souls, and, in short, all persons who rank as gentlemen of the intermediate category. In the britchka was seated such a gentleman, a man who, though not handsome, was not ill-favoured, not over-fat, and not over-thin. Also, though not over-elderly, he was not over-young. His arrival produced no stir in the town, and was accompanied by no particular incident, beyond that a couple of peasants who happened to be standing at the door of a dram-shop exchanged a few comments with reference to the equipage, rather than to the individual who was seated in it. Look at that carriage, one of them said to the other. Think you it will be going as far as Moscow? I think it will, replied his companion. But not as far as Kazan, eh? No, not as far as Kazan. With that, the conversation ended. Presently, as the britchka was approaching the inn, it was met by a young man in a pair of very short, very tight breeches of white dimity, a quasi-fashionable frock-coat, and a dicky fastened with a pistol-shaped bronze tie-pin. The young man turned his head as he passed the britchka and eyed it attentively, after which he clapped his hand to his cap, which was in danger of being removed by the wind, and resumed his way. On the vehicle reaching the inn door, its occupant found standing there to welcome him the polevoy, or waiter, of the establishment an individual of such nimble and brisk movement that even to distinguish the character of his face was impossible. Running out, with a napkin in one hand, and his lanky form clad in a tailcoat, reaching almost to the nape of his neck, he tossed back his locks, and escorted the gentleman upstairs along a wooden gallery, and so to the bedchamber which God had prepared for the gentleman's reception. The said bedchamber was of quite ordinary appearance, since the inn belonged to the species to be found in all provincial towns, the species wherein, for two roubles a day, travellers may obtain a room swarming with black beetles, and communicating by a doorway with the apartment adjoining. True, the doorway may be blocked up with a wardrobe, yet behind it, in all probability, there will be standing a silent, motionless neighbour whose ears are burning to learn every possible detail concerning the latest arrival. The inn's exterior corresponded with its interior. Long, and consisting of only two stories, the building had its lower half destitute of stucco, with the result that the dark red bricks, originally more or less dingy, had grown yet dingier under the influence of atmospheric changes. As for the upper half of the building, it was, of course, painted the usual tint of unfading yellow. Within, on the ground floor, there stood a number of benches heaped with horse collars, rope, and sheepskins, while the window-seat accommodated a zbitenshik, cheek by jowl, with a samovar, the latter so closely resembling the former in appearance, that, but for the fact of the samovar possessing a pitch-black lip, the samovar and the zbitenshik might have been two of a pair. During the traveller's inspection of his room, his luggage was brought into the apartment. First came a portmanteau of white leather whose raggedness indicated that the receptacle had made several previous journeys. The bearers of the same were the gentleman's coachman, Selifan, a little man in a large overcoat, and the gentleman's valet, Petrushka, the latter a fellow of about thirty, clad in a worn, over-ample jacket which had formerly graced his master's shoulders 
and possessed of a nose and a pair of lips whose coarseness communicated to his face rather a sullen expression behind the portmanteau came a small dispatch box of redwood lined with birch bark a bootcase and wrapped in blue paper a roast fowl all of which having been deposited the coachman departed to look after his horses and the valet to establish himself in the little dark anteroom or kennel where already he had stored a cloak a bag full of livery and his own peculiar smell pressing the narrow bedstead back against the wall he covered it with the tiny remnant of mattress a remnant as thin and flat perhaps also as greasy as a pancake which he had managed to beg of the landlord of the establishment while the attendants had been thus setting things straight the gentleman had repaired to the common parlour the appearance of common parlours of the kind is known to every one who travels always they have varnished walls which grown black in their upper portions with tobacco smoke are in their lower grown shiny with the friction of customers backs more especially with that of the backs of such local tradesmen as on market days make it their regular practice to resort to the local hostelry for a glass of tea also parlors of this kind invariably contain smutty ceilings an equally smutty chandelier a number of pendant shades which jump and rattle whenever the waiter scurries across the shabby oilcloth with a tray full of glasses the glasses looking like a flock of birds roosting by the seashore and a selection of oil paintings in short there are certain objects which one sees in every inn in the present case the only outstanding feature of the room was the fact that in one of the paintings a nymph was portrayed as possessing breasts of a size such as the reader can never in his life have beheld a similar caricaturing of nature is to be noted in the historical pictures of unknown origin period and creation which reach us sometimes through the instrumentality of russian magnates who profess to be connoisseurs of art from italy owing to the said magnates having made such purchases solely on the advice of the couriers who have escorted them to resume however our traveller removed his cap and divested his neck of a party-coloured woollen scarf of the kind which a wife makes for her husband with her own hands while accompanying the gift with interminable injunctions as to how best such a garment ought to be folded true bachelors also wear similar gauds but in their case god alone knows who may have manufactured the articles for my part i cannot endure them having unfolded the scarf the gentlemen ordered dinner and whilst the various dishes were being got ready cabbage soup a pie several weeks old a dish of marrow and peas a dish of sausages and cabbage a roast fowl some salted cucumber and the sweet tart which stands perpetually ready for use in such establishments whilst i say these things were either being warmed up or brought in cold the gentleman induced the waiter to retail certain fragments of tittle-tattle concerning the late landlord of the hostelry the amount of income which the hostelry produced and the character of its present proprietor to the last mentioned inquiry the waiter returned the answer invariably given in such cases namely my master is a terribly hard man sir curious that in enlightened russia so many people cannot even take a meal at an inn without chattering to the attendant and making free with him nevertheless not all the questions which the gentleman asked were aimless ones for he inquired who was the governor of the town who president of the local council and who public prosecutor in short he omitted no single official of note while asking also though with an air of detachment the most exact particulars concerning the landowners of the neighbourhood which of them he inquired possessed serfs and how many of them how far from the town did those landowners reside what was the character of each landowner and was he in the habit of paying frequent visits to the town the gentleman also made searching inquiries 
concerning the hygienic condition of the countryside. Was there, he asked, much sickness about, whether sporadic fever, fatal forms of ague, smallpox, or what not? Yet, though his solicitude concerning these matters showed more than ordinary curiosity, his bearing retained its gravity unimpaired, and from time to time he blew his nose with portentous fervor. Indeed, the manner in which he accomplished this latter feat was marvelous in the extreme, for, though that member emitted sounds equal to those of a trumpet in intensity, he could yet, with his accompanying air of guileless dignity, evoke the waiter's undivided respect, so much so that whenever the sounds of the nose reached that menial's ears, he would shake back his locks, straighten himself into a posture of marked solicitude, and inquire afresh, with a head slightly inclined, whether the gentleman happened to require anything further. After dinner, the guest consumed a cup of coffee, and then, seating himself upon the sofa, with, behind him, one of those wool-covered cushions which, in Russian taverns, resemble nothing so much as a cobblestone or a brick, fell to snoring, whereafter, Returning with a start to consciousness, he ordered himself to be conducted to his room, flung himself at full length upon the bed, and once more slept soundly for a couple of hours. Aroused, eventually, by the waiter, he, at the latter's request, inscribed a fragment of paper with his name, his surname, and his rank, for communication in accordance with the law to the police. And on that paper the waiter leaning forward from the corridor, read, syllable by syllable, Paul Ivanovich Chichikov, collegiate counsellor, landowner, travelling on private affairs. The waiter had just time to accomplish this feat before Paul Ivanovich Chichikov set forth to inspect the town. Apparently, the place succeeded in satisfying him, and, to tell the truth, it was at least up to the usual standard of our provincial capitals. Where the staring yellow of stone edifices did not greet his eye, he found himself confronted with the more modest grey of wooden ones, which, consisting for the most part of one or two stories, added to the range of attics which provincial architects love so well, looked almost lost amid the expanses of street and intervening medleys of broken or half-finished partition walls. At other points, evidence of more life and movement was to be seen, and here the houses stood crowded together and displayed dilapidated, rain-blurred signboards, whereon boots of cakes or pairs of blue breeches inscribed Arshavsky, Taylor, and so forth, were depicted. Over a shop containing hats and caps was written Vasily Fedorov, Foreigner while at another spot a signboard portrayed a billiard-table and two players, the latter clad in frock-coats of the kind usually affected by actors whose part it is to enter the stage during the closing act of a piece. Even though, with arms sharply crooked and legs slightly bent, the said billiard-players were taking the most careful aim, but succeeding only in making abortive strokes in the air, each emporium of the sort had written over it, This is the best establishment of its kind in the town. Also, al fresco in the streets, there stood tables heaped with nuts, soap, and gingerbread, the latter but little distinguishable from the soap, and at an eating-house there was displayed the sign of a plump fish transfixed with a gaff. But the sign most frequently to be discerned was the insignia of the state, the double-headed eagle, now replaced in this connection with the laconic inscription, Dram Shop. As for the paving of the town, it was uniformly bad. The gentleman peered into the municipal gardens, which contained only a few sorry trees that were poorly selected, requiring to be propped with oil-painted triangular green supports, and able to boast of a height no greater than that of an ordinary walking-stick. Yet recently the local paper had said, apropos of a gala, that, thanks to the efforts of our civil governor, the town has become enriched with a plaisance full of ombrageous 
spaciously branching trees even on the most sultry day they afford agreeable shade and indeed gratifying was it to see the hearts of our citizens panting with an impulse of gratitude as their eyes shed tears in recognition of all that their governor has done for them next after inquiring of a gendarme as to the best ways and means of finding the local council the local law courts and the local governor should he chichikov have need of them the gentleman went on to inspect the river which ran through the town en route he tore off a notice affixed to a post in order that he might the more conveniently read it after his return to the inn also he bestowed upon a lady of pleasant exterior who escorted by a footman laden with a bundle happened to be passing along a wooden sidewalk a prolonged stare lastly he threw around him a comprehensive glance as though to fix in his mind the general topography of the place and betook himself home there gently aided by the waiter he ascended the stairs to his bedroom drank a glass of tea and seating himself at the table called for a candle which having been brought him he produced from his pocket the notice held it close to the flame and conned its tenor slightly contracting his right eye as he did so yet there was little in the notice to call for remark all that it said was that shortly one of kotzebue's plays would be given and that one of the parts in the play was to be taken by a certain monsieur poplevin and another by a certain mademoiselle ziablova while the remaining parts were to be filled by a number of less important personages nevertheless the gentleman perused the notice with careful attention and even jotted down the prices to be asked for seats at the performance also he remarked that the bill had been printed in the press of the provincial government next he turned over the paper in order to see if anything further was to be read on the reverse side but finding nothing there he refolded the document placed it in the box which served him as a receptacle for odds and ends and brought the day to a close with a portion of cold veal a bottle of pickles and a sound sleep the following day he devoted to playing calls upon the various municipal officials a first and a very respectful visit being paid to the governor this personage turned out to resemble chichikov himself in that he was neither fat nor thin also he wore the riband of the order of saint anna about his neck and was reported to have been recommended also for the star for the rest he was large and good-natured and had a habit of amusing himself with occasional spells of knitting next chichikov repaired to the vice-governor's thence to the house of the public prosecutor to that of the president of the local council to that of the chief of police to that of the commissioner of taxes and to that of the local director of state factories true the task of remembering every big wig in this world of ours is not a very easy one but at least our visitor displayed the greatest activity in his work of paying calls seeing that he went so far as to pay his respects also to the inspector of the municipal department of medicine and to the city architect thereafter he sat thoughtfully in his britchka plunged in meditation on the subject of whom else it might be well to visit however not a single magnate had been neglected and in conversation with his hosts he had contrived to flatter each separate one for instance to the governor he had hinted that a stranger on arriving in his the governor's province would conceive that he had reached paradise so velvety were the roads governors who appoint capable subordinates had said chichikov are deserving of the most ample meed of praise again to the chief of police our hero had passed a most gratifying remark on the subject of the local gendarmerie while in his conversation with the vice-governor and the president of the local council neither of whom had as yet risen above the rank of state councillor he had twice been guilty of the gaucherie of addressing his interlocutors with the title of your excellency a blunder which had not failed to delight them in the result the governor had invited him to a reception the same evening 
and certain other officials had followed suit by inviting him, one of them to dinner, a second to a tea-party, and so forth, and so forth. Of himself, however, the traveller had spoken little, or, if he had spoken at any length, he had done so in a general sort of way, with marked modesty. Indeed, at moments of the kind his discourse had assumed something of a literary vein, in that invariably he had stated that, being a worm of no account in the world, he was deserving of no consideration at the hands of his fellows, that in time he had undergone many strange experiences, that subsequently he had suffered much in the cause of truth, that he had many enemies seeking his life, and that being desirous of rest, he was now engaged in searching for a spot wherein to dwell. Wherefore, having stumbled upon the town in which he now found himself, he had considered it his bounden duty to evince his respect for the chief authorities of the place. This, and no more, was all that, for the moment, the town succeeded in learning about the new arrival. Naturally, he lost no time in presenting himself at the governor's evening party. First, however, his preparations for that function occupied a space of over two hours, and necessitated an attention to his toilet of a kind not commonly seen. That is to say, after a brief postprandial nap, he called for soap and water, and spent a considerable period in the task of scrubbing his cheeks, which, for the purpose, he supported from within with his tongue, and then drying his full round face from the ears downwards with a towel which he took from the waiter's shoulder. Twice he snorted into the waiter's countenance as he did this, and then he posted himself in front of the mirror, donned a false shirt front, plucked out a couple of hairs which were protruding from his nose, and appeared vested in a frock-coat of bilberry-coloured check. Thereafter, driving through broad streets sparsely lighted with lanterns, he arrived at the governor's residence to find it illuminated as for a ball. Barouches with gleaming lamps, a couple of gendarmes posted before the doors, a babel of postillions' cries, nothing of a kind likely to be impressive was wanting and on reaching the salon the visitor actually found himself obliged to close his eyes for a moment so strong was the mingled sheen of lamps candles and feminine apparel everything seemed suffused with light and everywhere flitting and flashing were to be seen black coats even as on a hot summer's day flies revolve around a sugar loaf while the old housekeeper is cutting it into cubes before the open window, and the children of the house crowd around her to watch the movements of her rugged hands as those members ply the smoking pestle, and airy squadrons of flies, borne on the breeze, enter boldly, as though free of the house, and, taking advantage of the fact that the glare of the sunshine is troubling the old lady's sight, disperse themselves over broken and unbroken fragments alike even though the lethargy induced by the opulence of summer and the rich shower of dainties to be encountered at every step has induced them to enter less for the purpose of eating than for that of showing themselves in public of parading up and down the sugar-loaf of rubbing both their hindquarters and their fore against one another of cleaning their bodies under the wings of extending their forelegs over their heads and grooming themselves and of flying out of the window again to return with other predatory squadrons indeed so dazed was chichikov that scarcely did he realize that the governor was taking him by the arm and presenting him to his the governor's lady yet the newly arrived guest kept his head sufficiently to contrive to murmur some such compliment as might befittingly come from a middle-aged individual of a rank neither excessively high nor excessively low next when the couples had been formed for dancing and the remainder of the company found itself pressed back against the walls chichikov folded his arms and carefully scrutinized the dancers some of the ladies were dressed well and in the fashion while the remainder were clad in such garments as god usually bestows upon a provincial town also here as elsewhere the men belonged to two separate and distinct categories, one of which comprised slender individuals who, flitting around the ladies, were scarcely to be distinguished from denizens of the metropolis, so carefully, so artistically groomed were their whiskers, 
so presentable their oval clean-shaven faces so easy the manner of their dancing attendance upon the woman-folk so glib their french conversation as they quizzed their female companions as for the other category it comprised individuals who stout or of the same build as chichikov that is to say neither very portly nor very lean backed and sidled away from the ladies and kept peering hither and thither to see whether the governor's footmen had set out green tables for whist their features were full and plump some of them had beards and in no case was their hair curled or waved or arranged in what the french call the devil-may-care style on the contrary their heads were either close-cropped or brushed very smooth and their faces were round and firm this category represented the more respectable officials of the town in passing i may say that in business matters fat men always prove superior to their leaner brethren which is probably the reason why the latter are mostly to be found in the political police or acting as mere ciphers whose existence is a purely hopeless airy trivial one again stout individuals never take a back seat but always a front one and wheresoever it may be they sit firmly and with confidence and decline to budge even though a seat crack and bend with their weight for comeliness of exterior they care not a rap and therefore a dress coat sits less easily on their figures than is the case with figures of leaner individuals yet invariably fat men amass the greater wealth in three years time a thin man will not have a single serf whom he has left unpledged whereas well pray look at a fat man's fortunes and what will you see first of all a suburban villa and then a larger suburban villa and then a villa close to town and lastly a country estate which comprises every amenity that is to say having served both god and the state the stout individual has won universal respect and will end by retiring from business reordering his mode of life and becoming a russian landowner in other words a fine gentleman who dispenses hospitality lives in comfort and luxury and is destined to leave his property to heirs who are proposing to squander the same on foreign travel that the foregoing represents pretty much the gist of chichikov's reflections as he stood watching the company i will not attempt to deny and of those reflections the upshot was that he decided to join himself to the stouter section of the guests among whom he had already recognized several familiar faces namely those of the public prosecutor a man with beetling brows over eyes which seemed to be saying with a wink come into the next room my friend for i have something to say to you though in the main their owner was a man of grave and taciturn habit of the postmaster an insignificant-looking individual yet a would-be wit and a philosopher and of the president of the local council a man of much amiability and good sense these three personages greeted chichikov as an old acquaintance and to their salutations he responded with a sidelong yet a sufficiently civil bow also he became acquainted with an extremely unctuous and approachable landowner named manilov and with a landowner of more uncouth exterior named sobakevitch the latter of whom began the acquaintance by treading heavily upon chichikov's toes and then begging his pardon next chichikov received an offer of a cut-in at whist and accepted the same with his usual courteous inclination of the head seating themselves at a green table the party did not rise therefrom till supper-time and during that period all conversation between the players had become hushed as is the custom when men have given themselves up to a really serious pursuit even the postmaster a talkative man by nature had no sooner taken the cards into his hand than he assumed an expression of profound thought pursed his lips and retained this attitude unchanged throughout the game only when playing a court card was it his custom to strike the table with his fist and exclaim if the card happened to be a queen now old popadia and if the card happened to be a king now peasant of tambov to which his ejaculations invariably the president and the local council retorted ah i have him by the ears i have him by the ears and from the neighbourhood of the table other strong ejaculations relative to the play would arise interposed with one or another of those nicknames which participants in a game are apt to apply to members of the various suits 
i need hardly add that the game over the players fell to quarrelling and that in the dispute our friend joined though so artfully as to let every one see that in spite of the fact that he was wrangling he was doing so only in the most amicable fashion possible never did he say outright you played the wrong card at such and such a point no he always employed some such phrase as you permitted yourself to make a slip and thus afforded me the honour of covering your deuce indeed the better to keep in accord with his antagonists he kept offering them his silver enamelled snuff-box at the bottom of which lay a couple of violets placed there for the sake of their scent in particular did the newcomer pay attention to landowners manilov and sobakevitch so much so that his haste to arrive on good terms with them led to his leaving the president and the postmaster rather in the shade at the same time certain questions which he put to those two landowners evinced not only curiosity but also a certain amount of sound intelligence for he began by asking them how many peasant souls each of them possessed and how their affairs happened at present to be situated and then proceeded to enlighten himself also as their standing and their families indeed it was not long before he had succeeded in fairly enchanting his new friends in particular did manilov a man still in his prime and possessed of a pair of eyes which sweet as sugar blinked whenever he laughed find himself unable to make enough of his enchanter clasping chichikov long and fervently by the hand he besought him to do him manilov the honour of visiting his country house which he declared to lie at a distance of not more than fifteen versts from the boundaries of town and in return chichikov averred with an exceedingly affable bow and a most sincere handshake that he was prepared not only to fulfil his friend's behest but also to look upon the fulfilling of it as a sacred duty in the same way sobakevitch said to him laconically and do you pay me a visit and then proceeded to shuffle a pair of boots of such dimensions that to find a pair to correspond with them would have been indeed difficult more especially at the present day when the race of epic heroes is beginning to die out in russia next day chichikov dined and spent the evening at the house of the chief of police a residence where three hours after dinner every one sat down to whist and remained so seated until two o'clock in the morning on this occasion chichikov made the acquaintance of among others a landowner named nozdrev a dissipated little fellow of thirty who had no sooner exchanged three or four words with his new acquaintance than he began to address him in the second person singular yet although he did the same to the chief of police and the public prosecutor the company had no sooner seated themselves at the card-table than both the one and the other of these functionaries started to keep a careful eye upon nozdrev's tricks and to watch practically every card which he played the following evening chichikov spent with the president of the local council who received his guests even though the latter included two ladies in a greasy dressing-gown upon that followed an evening at the vice-governor's a large dinner-party at the house of the commissioner of taxes a smaller dinner-party at the house of the public prosecutor a very wealthy man and a subsequent reception given by the mayor in short not an hour of the day did chichikov find himself forced to spend at home and his return to the inn became necessary only for the purposes of sleeping somehow or other he had landed on his feet and everywhere he figured as an experienced man of the world no matter what the conversation chanced to be about he always contrived to maintain his part in the same did the discourse turn upon horse-breeding upon horse-breeding he happened to be particularly well qualified to speak did the company fall to discussing well-bred dogs at once he had remarks of the most pertinent kind possible to offer did the company touch upon a prosecution which had recently been carried out by the excise department instantly he showed that he too was not wholly unacquainted with legal affairs did an opinion chance to be expressed concerning billiards on that subject too he was at least able to avoid committing a blunder did a reference occur to virtue concerning virtue he hastened to deliver himself in a way which brought tears to every eye did the subject in hand happen to be the distilling of brandy well that was a matter concerning which he had the soundest of knowledge did any one happen to mention customs officials and inspectors from that moment he expatiated as though he too had been both a minor functionary and a major 
yet a remarkable fact was the circumstance that he always contrived to temper his omniscience with a certain readiness to give way a certain ability so to keep a rein upon himself that never did his utterances become too loud or too soft or transcend what was perfectly befitting in a word he was always a gentleman of excellent manners and every official in the place felt pleased when he saw him enter the door thus the governor gave it as his opinion that chichikov was a man of excellent intentions the public prosecutor said that he was a good man of business the chief of gendarmerie that he was a man of education the president of the local council that he was a man of breeding and refinement and the wife of the chief of gendarmerie that his politeness of behaviour was equalled only by his affability of bearing nay even sobakevitch who as a rule never spoke well of any one said to his lanky wife when on returning late from the town he undressed and betook himself to bed by her side my dear this evening after dinner with the chief of police i went on to the governor's and met there among others a certain paul ivanovitch chichikov who is a collegiate councillor and a very pleasant fellow to this his spouse replied hm, and then dealt him a hearty kick in the ribs such were the flattering opinions earned by the newcomer to the town and these opinions he retained until the time when a certain specialty of his a certain scheme of his the reader will learn presently what it was plunged the majority of the townsfolk into a sea of perplexity end of part one chapter one